Yeah, we needed the majority of the variants that went into the burden test for uh, NOD2 were rare variants or private variants. So without them, it wasn't significant. Probably if you had had a larger sample size, then just using the known biomarkers would have been sufficient to pluck, uh, to pluck it out. But because it was a small sample size, we did need the impact of the rare variants to get to realize a significant result. And, and one other thing I didn't mention about the, the burden test, you, you do actually, um, you can tweak it and dial up the significance of the rare variants. So you can tell it how, how much added weight to lend to rare variation and that can be tweaked and set. And it was, it was set at the default levels, but um, that's something that perhaps people might consider adjusting uh, depending on what they're looking at. Okay, thanks so much, and I'm sure Sarah can answer any, any other questions at coffee. So our next speaker is Professor Mark Pallon, who's from Warwick Medical School, and he's going to tell us about metagenomics in microbial systems. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you. So my story begins um, with this outbreak in Germany of a particularly nasty form of E. coli that struck Germany in 2011. Um, and you probably remember from the headlines that it was a deadly disease and it was linked to uh, sprouting seeds, the bean sprouts. And we got involved because I was involved in uh, this open source genomics analysis um, where we did crowdsourced analysis of the genome and used so it showed how social media could be used to augment academic discourse uh, and also showed that benchtop sequencers could be used uh, in this kind of setting. Now, we were very pleased that we managed to get a publication in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, and we did this in collaboration with uh, collaborators in Germany and in China. Um, but at the time we had the publication out, I hadn't actually met the guys uh, in Germany. We'd done it all by email and uh, on the phone. And so we popped over to Germany. They invited us over, and we had some champagne together. And we said, well, you know, what are we going to do now? Because... People just say we were a one-hit wonder. We got lucky. We got into New England Journal. So here's me with Martin Etfelbacher, who's the head of the <coughs> lab in Germany. Uh, and I said, well, what's your unique selling point? What's our unique selling point that we may be able to exploit? And he said, well, he's got a freezer full of shit, basically. <laughs> he had over 200 samples from the uh, outbreak. And I said, well, we're quite good at sequencing and bioinformatics. Why don't we just sequence the shit? Uh, um, and he said, what, what do you mean? Um, and we had to scratch our heads and basically I said, well, if we look at the way bacteriology is currently done, many of the techniques we're using date back to the 19th century, not let alone the 20th century. We use the gram stain and then we culture things on solid media uh, to gain them in pure uh, culture as colonies and propagate them. And these techniques, as I say, date back to the 1880s. And I said, well, why don't we try using metagenomics? So uh, just take those fecal samples, extract the DNA from them, and sequence that directly without having to bother to culture the organism first. So in our initial study of part of the outbreak study that was published in the journal, this, the stool samples gave rise to a pure culture of the E. coli that was then sequenced, could we not go directly from the stool samples to get the same result? And uh, we were very heartened with the, I mean, I went into this thinking, if we detect any E. coli sequences in the metagenome, if we detect the sugar toxin genes in, in the metagenome, that would be a result. But instead, on the first sample we looked at, we got over 20-fold coverage of the outbreak strain genome recovered from the metagenome of the stool sample. And we could see a number of interesting features. There's this kind of smiling effect, which is what you see when bacteria are actually rapidly growing because the parts of the chromosome that are close to the origin of replication are overrepresented. Um, we saw a little upswing in the uh, coverage around the bacteriophage that encodes the sugar toxin. And we interpret that as probably being the result of free bacteriophage particles um, in the stool sample as well. Uh, we could actually work out what kind of E. coli it was using a, uh, a technique called MLST applied to this data. So we were, we were very pleased and we thought this is very exciting that we can actually detect uh, 
the genome of the outbreak strain in these samples um, uh, without having to culture anything first. And then we approached JAMA uh, and JAMA, the American Medical Association, because they were running a special genomic medicine issue. And we said, to, you know, genomic medicine includes microbiology. You happy with that? They said, yeah. Um, and then we put forward our plans, and they then came back and said, well, isn't it cheating what you're doing? Because you've got the outbreak strain genome, and you're aligning your metagenome against it. But really what you should be doing is taking those fecal metagenomes and pulling out that strain genome without knowing what it was. So put yourself back in the shoes of the guys dealing with the outbreak at the outset, not knowing what they were dealing with. You know, and doing this aligning against known genome is a bit like solving a jigsaw puzzle when you've got the lid of the jigsaw and you're just aligning your pieces. What was a, 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 a harder challenge, and the one that they more or less set us, was to do it from scratch, de novo. Now, luckily, I, at the time, was working with a very smart bioinformatician called Nick Lohman, um, and he took this t task as a challenge and thought, how is he going to solve this issue? So what we did, we had 40-odd uh, uh, samples from the outbreak. Um, and we said, OK, so if this is an outbreak, we can expect to see um, representation of the outbreak strain in at least two of those samples. So let's have a look. What do we see when we look at all of the sequence diversity in, in at least two samples? And this is the kind of taxonomic mess we get. So basically, he'd, he'd smeared it out by GC content and coverage depth here, and then done a quick uh, series of, uh, of searches to assign them to a, a taxonomic group. And you can see here that there's a... Uh, a huge degree of uh, taxonomic variation within this sample um, and our, our outbreak strain belong to the Enterobacteriales this pinkish smear here but there's no way you can say that you're going to get an outbreak strain genome out of that so then we said well Nick said well let's make a simplifying assumption that actually the outbreak strain, strain genome sequences are going to be represented in at least half of our s samples so let's exclude everything that isn't present in half our samples. And that led to um, a great simplification of what was there in terms of the taxonomic diversity. But you can still see that it's still quite a complex taxonomic mixture. Um, so he was scratching his head and thinking, how is he going to actually solve this one? And he came up with the idea, well, actually, all we need to do is subtract what's found in normal individuals. Uh, from what's uh, in these samples, and that might get us there. Now, fortunately, we didn't have to go and collect a load of uh, fecal samples from age matched to German controls because they were already available because of a project called MetaHit that was doing the uh, fecal microbiome of healthy individuals. So we just picked uh, 40 samples and subtracted out um, the uh, everything that was present in the normal samples in healthy individuals um, and this then allowed us to get drilled down to actually getting the outbreak strain genome uh, uh, pretty much uh, clearly. There was still one more trick though that he needed to do uh, because this will subtract out all of um, the accessory genome, uh, sorry the core genome of the uh, E. coli that will be present in all E. coli and only allow us to see the accessory genome. So he did one final trick uh, with help from um, a, a collaborator, Chris Quint, uh, which actually then bin things by coverage in each of the different samples. And we ended up managing to reconstruct the genome of the outbreak strain um, from these uh, metagenomes without culture. So we were very pleased, and we ended up getting our paper accepted in JAMA. Now that was an interesting... Uh, escapade for us in metagenomics was our first real uh, escapade but interestingly around the same time uh, I used to go drinking on a Friday night in the bar at the University of Birmingham where I came across this guy Vince Gaffney who was an archaeologist and I said why don't you do some kind of ancient DNA work why don't we have a look at some of your samples and I thought he might give me a pharaoh's hand or something like that exciting thing like that to look at uh, and after I'd kind of been talking to him for a while he, he finally said, okay, we'll do something. I want you to analyze some sludge, some mud, some sediment. Uh, 
I said, mm, okay, it doesn't sound very glamorous, but um, from that, uh, we actually hooked up uh, uh, and did this study. Um, actually, I, just around that time, I moved to, uh, to Warwick and met this guy, Robin Allaby, who had an ancient DNA lab in Warwick, uh, and basically the three of us then uh, drove this project forward. Now, what was the question that, that uh, Vince was interested in? Well, he was interested in something called the Neolithic transition, um, which is uh, where uh, humans started uh, farming, effectively uh, domesticating plants and animals and, and farming them. Um, and Vince uh, was interested in this transition, but his uh, idea was that actually if we look at what's going on in England now, we're not getting the full picture because a lot of land was actually... Um, submerged by sea level rises in the time since the Neolithic transition. And uh, so he said, actually, we should be looking at these now submerged sediments, and this would give us a clue. Um, and an interesting link to the previous speaker, he actually um, got some samples from a place called Boldener Cliff here, which is just off the Isle of Wight in the Solent. Um, and we then started looking at this sedimentary ancient DNA, so we extracted DNA uh, from these sediment cores and then looked at it. Um, and this just shows you where the Boldner Cliff sample was uh, taken from. Um, and with a wave of the hand, I'm uh, sort of glancing over the submarine archaeology, which is a considerable achievement to actually go down and retrieve those samples and then all the other archaeology that was done. Um, in a sense, of we, as was a simple part. Anyway, with the sedimentary and ancient DNA analysis, we did some aluminous sequencing. Um, we then uh, tried to uh, analyze the reeds and assign them to uh, the best taxonomic level. Um, and in, this is where Robin took over, and he was very careful to avoid this problem. That, as you may have seen, there have been these uh, headlines about there's platypus sequences everywhere, there was plague on the New York subway. It's very easy to just make misassignments, make silly assignments when you, if you just take the best scoring uh, blast hit and so forth. <laughs> anyway, what he found was that uh, uh, when he looked at the non-microbial fraction, which is uh, the microbes made up most of it, but they're not, he found uh, no matches to marine mammals, so that was good. It was suggesting we really were looking at uh, terrestrial uh, signals rather than anything coming from the sea. But he found bovids, pigs, dogs, chickens, canids uh, in there. And he also found lots of plant uh, sequences as well. Um, and interestingly, among the plant sequences, he found uh, these triticum and triti 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 uh, sequences. Um, uh, and in two of the samples, there was a very large bloom of, of this triticum of wheat. Um, and what he based, this is just pulled out of the paper, Basically, it revealed that we have wheat uh, DNA in these samples, and this was 2,000 years earlier than expected from the known archaeology. Um, and there was no evidence uh, from the pollen profile that the wheat was being cultivated there, um, and so we assumed on the basis of parsimony that probably it was, had been grown elsewhere and that trading had, had taken place. So that, that got us a paper in science. Um, and then, in parallel, I was approached uh, by um, uh, this lady, Helen Donoghue, from London, who had some 200-year-old uh, material that she said had TB in it. And I said, well, we could try and get some sequence information for you, but what I'd like to do is shotgun metagenomics. I'm not going to start setting up capture probes or, or amplification based approaches uh, so let's let's just try doing shotgun metagenomics and one of the interesting developments in recent years is that you can do these kind of experiments cheaply and easily uh, Illumina sequencing on the MySeq is sufficiently user friendly that you know every PhD student can learn how to do it and the costs you know it's a few thousand pounds at most um, so we could sit in our armchair and, and come up with reasons why it wasn't going to work. We thought, well, there might be loads and loads of human DNA in there, um, and that would swamp any signal from the TB, or there might be uh, post-mortem contamination with other bacteria, which would swamp the signal. Um, but we said, let's just do it anyway, because it, it won't cost much. 
I said, do it, but put it on the back burner. And you know, six weeks later, the postdoc said, oh, well, I finally got around to doing it. And, and then I was knocked off my chair. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So let me just contextualize what we did. So the samples we had came from a town called Vats in Hungary. Um, it's up in the northern part, in the center, center of the northern part of Hungary. Um, and there's this church there, a uh, Dominican church. And in 1994, a crypt was discovered when we were doing some renovation. <laughs> They broke into this crypt, which had been uh, undisturbed for uh, 150 years. It had been used for about 100 years for burials of the middle class families and clerics, the, the Roman Catholic families from uh, that town. And for some strange reason, which is not quite understood, many of the, there's about 200 odd bodies, and um, many of them were actually naturally mummified. So instead of becoming decayed completely down to skeletons, there was some soft tissue left. And we focused initially on this uh, lady here, Terezia Hausman. And so here is her mummy. Um, here is her death record as well. She died um, uh, on the 26th of December, 1797, at the age of 28. Uh, these uh, mummies had actually been investigated in, in the early part of the uh, 21st century um, with uh, chest x-rays and other kinds of examinations. In her case, the chest x-ray didn't show any signs of tuberculosis, but she appeared to be cachectic, consistent with TB, um, and microbiological and molecular analyses that have been done, including PCR, they even attempted to grow the TB from her and failed, but they did see acid fast bacilli in the samples, um, and this suggested that there was probably going to be a good yield of TB DNA in her sample. But I went into this again, as we did with the, with the fecal the metagenomic study, thinking, well, if we get a handful, half a dozen or a dozen or whatever, uh, uh, sequences that are un 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 unambiguously derived from TB, that would be a good result. Instead, what we got from her and from uh, eventually from uh, seven other uh, individuals was genome level coverage of uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So here's a table that uh, reveals the uh, individuals we studied, um, some of their uh, epidemiological data. Um, and then you can see the, the, the numbers of thousands of reads that map to the <coughs> genome of H7, uh, H37RV, which is kind of taken as a reference genome for TB. And we achieved levels of, varying levels of coverage. In the case of Tourette's Hausman, initially we got about 30-fold coverage. And then when we went back and did it again, we got over 300-fold coverage of, of a TB genome. In one other case, we got 187-fold coverage. So remarkable amounts of... Um, of, of TB genomes from these. And all of the genomes that we recovered had a, a, a seven base pair deletion in one particular gene which marks them out as belonging to one particular lineage of TB known as the Euro-American lineage or lineage 4. It's also worth noting that um, most of the bodies that we studied here actually yielded more than one genotype of TB. And this was a surprise to me. I thought, what, what's going on? And I guess, uh, initially I thought, you know, sure, this is some kind of mistake here. One body, in fact, yielded three distinct genotypes. Um, and we were thinking, what does this mean? Is, does this mean uh, that there was a real difference between epidemiology of TB in Europe today and in this historical setting? And it led us to actually go and look at the literature and recontextualize modern microbiology. So if you think about the way in which uh, TB is diagnosed conventionally now, we still do go through that step of going for uh, colony picks. We, we, we uh, grow the organism on solid medium and pick a single colony. So that's not going to detect mixed infections very well. Um, and when we looked in the literature, there was uh, one study from KwaZulu Natal that said up to one in five cases in that high prevalence area had mixed infections. Um, and there was another study where they found four distinct genotypes from a single patient. So it certainly changed the way I was thinking about TB. And you start to think, well, if everyone has TB, or most people, and about 50% of these bodies from this crypt had evidence of TB, um, then why would you expect to be coughed on once with just one strain? If everyone's coughing over everyone all the time, it perhaps is, is sensible, you know, more plausible to think that you're going to get multiple uh, uh, strains. We then tried some phylogenetic uh, dating. Uh, this is a kind of dark art. Um, 
in what one in more, one's more cynical uh, mindset, you might say it's just kind of glorified guessing. But basically, you can plug in the the, the genome sequences that we have, these ones shown by stars, the historical ones, and you can calculate well, the common ancestor and the distance of the common ancestor. You can work out a mutation rate. And what we found was that this um, that our findings were consistent with a relatively recent origin of the MTB complex. We weren't the first to say that. A paper a few months before us had said something similar. And this conflicts actually with the evidence that TB occurred in the Neolithic. Uh, um, and it's, it's basically pressed forward this uh, need to have Neolithic samples and try and do metagenomics to get genome level information. And so we're currently doing this on some Neolithic samples from a site in Israel, a submerged site, in fact, called Atlet Yam. Um, so far, we haven't actually been successful, but uh, that is the challenge. Uh, and as part of this uh, line of work, we've also been looking for leprosy genomes, and we've recovered three medieval leprosy uh, genomes using these kind of approaches. But, you know, I guess this gives you some bragging rights. Uh, Bill Gates noticed the research and actually tweeted on it. And that gave me, certainly gave me bragging rights with my children because they went, Dad's been tweeting. Yeah. But we've got, Bill Gates has been talking to him. I tried to actually engage in a conversation with him on Twitter, but he didn't actually respond to my, my attempts. But uh, those of you who are clinically qualified are going to say, what the hell? You know, the good news is we have a diagnosis. The bad news is it's 200 years too late to do anything about it. So what's the point of that? And we did think, well, yeah, actually nobody's done this kind of met metagenomics on sputum samples or contemporary tissue samples from patients with tuberculosis. So why don't we have a go and see if it works? Uh, and so what we did was we hooked up with some collaborators uh, in the Gambia at the MRC unit there, and we applied this kind of approach. I got a PhD student, Emma Doughty, who's shown here, um, to actually analyze sputum samples from the Gambia, extracting DNA um, in the same kind of way. So here we took this a set of eight samples here, um, and this gives you the, um, the results that we got in terms of numbers of reads. Here, that kind of complaint that you have in your arm child, it's not gonna work because you've got too much human DNA. There was some more truth in that because we did get large amounts of human DNA. And in some cases, 99% uh, of the reads were human DNA. But nonetheless, there were enough reads that mapped to the M tuberculosis H37RV genome for us to actually say that yes, each of these samples contained uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. So we could make a diagnosis uh, using metagenomics. Um, in none of these cases did we actually get uh, genome level. I mean, the best one here was points at 0.7 fold coverage of a genome. Many of the others were far less than that. But nonetheless, there was a large number of reads, and we could, uh, it, we drew a, a, a phylogeny of the various lineages in uh, M tuberculosis, and we were then able to place the reads that we got from these samples on that phylogeny and actually assign, uh, in all but one case, uh, the TB genome to an existing lineage. Um, so that was quite interesting. What we were not able to do was get enough depth of coverage that we'd be able to call out uh, resistance-associated mutations, which would have been uh, and would be the, 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 the ideal thing that would, what one would want to do in this situation. But we were pleased that it worked at all, actually, um, and it was the first proof of principle here. So where is all this going? Um, we have this excitement the excitement's been going on for so long now that it's perhaps getting to be hype rather than excitement. But the excitement is that nanopore sequencing is going to come along and give us accessible sequencing, you know, a palm top sequencer rather than a um, bench top sequencer. And you can take a sample, uh, put it through a nanopore. And there is proof of principle that nanopore sequencing might work on all different macromolecules. So you might be able to sequence DNA, RNA, and proteins from clinical samples. Uh, and from the circulation, and several other uh, speakers have already spoken about the potential applications for this uh, kind of approach. And it would be an interesting unification of laboratory medicine if we did come up with a way in which we could analyze all these samples using similar kinds of workflows uh, to get the sequence data, and then the hard work of actually working out what it all means would be done in the bioinformatics afterwards.
And um, that just uh, leads me to just give one shout out. I could have spoken more about this, and perhaps I should have done, that we actually are uh, running a um, MRC project where we're trying to set up an infrastructure, or we are setting up an infrastructure uh, on a, a cloud computing-based infrastructure to serve the uh, medical microbial research community um, where we're building this cloud that spans four universities and we're having our grand launch event uh, uh, in July. And if anyone's interested to come and uh, get an account, anyone works with microbes and wants to start using this facility, then um, you can get online and register and you'll get an account in July. So, finally, uh, there's been a lot of talk about prediction over the last uh, day or so. And here are three quotes about predictions. Um, so the first one, I've seen the future and it works. Uh, I first used that when I was in Berlin, um, very close to the Berlin Wall. And that quote actually comes from the 1920s, and it's from an American journalist who went to the Soviet Union uh, and thought that he'd found a modern society. Uh, and you know, that society did survive for several more decades, but then finally collapsed. So it's, you have to be slightly careful. Um, I think perhaps a more apposite uh, quote there is from William Gibson, that the future's already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. So the things that we can do in the university environment, um, uh, using the massive firepower that we have with our sequencers, is all very well, but whether that's going to be distributed out into uh, clinical practice soon is, is, is hard to say. Anyway, I think that's me finished. I'd just like to put up an acknowledgement slide to acknowledge all the people who've done all the hard work and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. That's a really fascinating talk. We've got some questions. One um, your low read depth coverage in the current samples uh, of the tuberculosis, mm -hmm. how much of a worry is contamination when you're picking up such a low read depth? Um, well, there, there are a, a number of issues there. Uh, one issue is that you can have non-tuberculous mycobacteria in samples. And when you're doing a mapping-based approach, if you're not careful, those can align against your reference genome and falsely give you an idea that you might have TB there when you haven't. Um, we have uh, That's been actually a problem with the ancient samples more than the modern ones, because most of the time you don't get the... The, the, those in contemporary samples, but you can adjust the uh, stringency of your mapping such that you can uh, not tolerate any mismatch, hardly any mismatches at all, a very small number, and then uh, remove that problem. And you can detect the problem by looking at the evenness of coverage. So if you do a coverage plot and you see that there's lots of spikes where they're, say, aligning against conserved genes, then that's a, a worry. In terms of contamination, I mean, there's no particular reason to think that you're going to get TB in a sample um, that uh, has been taken clinically and handled in the appropriate way. I mean, you do sometimes get cross-contamination in laboratories um, where, you know, if, if you have two, two samples of the adjacent uh, serial numbers and they both got the same thing in and one of them is perfectly well and it doesn't fit. We do see that in the microbiology lab, but I, I wouldn't think that would be an issue here. I mean, I think the issue is that we need to get the depth of coverage higher. And there are a number of ways in which you could do that. One is um, you could actually culture the organisms for a while. Um, and they have, there's a lot of interest in actually, instead of going directly at the sputum, putting it into the midget tubes that, that people grow TB in, and waiting until you get a signal of growth of after a few days, and then directly sequencing that material rather than trying to propagate it on solid medium pick colonies. Um, and that certainly would uh, give you a, a, a greater depth of coverage because you've got much higher biomass. The other alternative would be to try and capture the TB or deplete the human DNA. And both approaches, uh, people are trying that as well. So we'll have to see. Uh, the, the beauty of shotgun metagenomics is, is a simple procedure. If you start adding all these difficult other steps, it makes it harder, that's all. Okay, thanks very much, Mark. Right, thank you.